I'm going to do that for the women. I'm going to be that for the women audience, for our women demographic. I'm going to be as open and as honest as I can about my insecurities, about man boobs, about my double chin, about the cut on my lip, about my receding hairline, about every single thing. I think if I could, if I could relate to the lowest common denominator, as far as your insecurity, I I can form a connection with everybody. And so what happened was I started getting people saying to me, oh my God, you're saying what I'm thinking. You said what I'm thinking. That's exactly what I'm thinking. And I was like, holy crap, this is working. And I was just being as real as I possibly could. Welcome to the Art of Coaching Podcast, a show aimed at getting to the core of what it takes to change attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes in the weight room, boardroom, classroom, and everywhere in between. I'm your host, Brett Bartholomew. I'm a performance coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the book, Conscious Coaching. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student interested in all aspects of human behavior and communication. I want to thank you for joining me. And now let's dive into today's episode. Hey, everybody, it's Brett. Good to have you back. I want you to think about a time where you had a conversation with somebody that didn't go as well as you had hoped. It started off well enough, but whether you were trying to build trust with them, build rapport with them, make a true connection of any kind, or even solve a problem, you just felt like somewhere you lost your way along the course of the discussion. And then when you reflected on it, you realized, man, if only I knew how to shut up and ask better questions and listen more effectively, that could have gone a completely different way. Have you ever done that? Have you ever even felt embarrassed about the way a conversation you took part in went when you thought about it later on? Listen, you're not alone. That's called being human, but it's also one of the reasons I wanted to have our guest on today. He is one of the most socially skilled individuals that I know. And it was a little bit of a tug of war with him because he kept trying over the course of the show to put the focus on me and I wanted to keep it on him, which just shows why he is in the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. John J. Van S. yes, is in the Hall of Fame and he is the host of a top ranked nationally syndicated radio show called the John J. and Rich Show. And he has interviewed everybody from celebrities, political figures, sports stars, everything in between. And he knows what it's like to grind as well. He had interned, he, he, he had aspirations about getting on Saturday Night Live, he had worked on a TV station, he knew he always wanted to be in radio, and eventually he made it to the top, and he's still there to this day. And what I really appreciate about him is he pulls no punches, which is a reminder, if you don't like adult content, there's going to be some, some swear words here, there's going to be some other things that if you're in the car with kids, listen to this later, but you know... He has to get on and he has to navigate a wide array of social relationships. And guess what, guys? That's leadership. That's coaching. That's life. Who better to learn the art of conversation, especially messy conversation, the ones that happen in real life, from a broadcasting legend? And you're going to jump right into this episode. We didn't do a lot of banter. So you need to be ready because by the time the show starts, we are off and rolling and he's just a supremely interesting person. So if you're a parent, if you are a manager, if you are anybody that's had to create content or put yourself and your ideas in in center stage, no matter how nervous you might've been about it, you will love this episode. If you just wanna hear an interesting conversation between a fascinating individual and, and a person like me, you will also love it. And I couldn't be more excited to bring it to you. Also, in the name of learning from people from a wide variety of fields, I want to remind you there's only a few days left to register for our Art of Coaching Communication and Leadership Summit. Now, despite what the name may connotate, guys, this is simple. We've had experts from every field come in and talk about what they've learned from experiences on the messy side of leadership in their domain. I mean, we have people from finance, we have people from the medical world, people who work with the military, and everybody is telling you the things you will not get in the wishy-washy leadership books that we often read so much, right? This is the the realities, the takeaways, the real world applicable knowledge, this stuff that you're going to be able to take away. Did a negotiation go sour? Why? Did you offend somebody unintentionally? Why? Do you need to get through to somebody stubborn? How can you manage it? How do you know how to read the room? These are the things that are going to be covered. And we're going to have a little devil's advocate back and forth. So it's not a boring Zoom clinic. So make sure you go to artofcoaching.com forward slash summit. Again, that's artofcoaching.com forward slash summit for that. 
And if that's not your bag and you want something a little bit more interactive all the way through, you're craving authentic connection, we got that too. We've gotten off of social media and we've created a partnership with an app called Channels. And if you go to artofcoaching.com forward slash channels, you are going to be able to enter a community where I go live with content that I don't share on this podcast or anywhere else every single week. We have video-based interactions, no more logging into Facebook and having to type a bunch, no more character limits on Twitter, no more you know captions that you can only type by phone. Literally, if you have a question about books to read, your business, what path you should take, how you should deal with somebody with a difficult personality, all these things, I will respond to you in real time with a customized video for you, no fluff, and you get to interact with other people face-to-face via video in the community. Just go to artofcoaching.com forward slash channels. I promise if you're somebody that's gotten sick of social media and you like actual connection and you want detailed answers instead of fluff, you will love this. All right, enough of me. On to broadcasting legend, John J. Van S. Now we're rolling now, John Jay. So no, no pre-interview. You're on the air. You're on the air. Good. So let me apologize for this the growth on my chin. Hey, that, uh, what do you have there? Break it down for us. The audience can't see it, but I, you know, I can. Maybe we'll. Oh, record. oh, so this isn't a video podcast too. It's just audio. It's just video for you and me to see each other. You know what? It's going to be now. Now it is going to be full on video. We have it. No, I'm glad that it's not video because I was going to say I was shaving on, on Friday or so and something happened, but it's not your normal Nick. It's like turning into some infection. I went actually was at my doctor yesterday, which hold on a second. I'm going to jump all over the place. That's fine. I was at my doctor yesterday. And uh, I, this doctor I go to also has these hyperbaric chambers. Yep. Right. And I was like, I can't wait to talk to Brett about these oh, hyperbaric boy. chambers. But what, what's your take on hyperbaric chambers? Yeah, man. Uh, they, I'll get, I'll get riddled by some listeners on this. But um, good in theory, don't do what they they uh, they claim to. The best thing, if you really want like altitude and and all that kind of stuff, is you want to live high and train low. So you want to live at high altitude and be able to train at or around sea level. Because what happens is it takes so long for the body to truly acclimate to altitude. I mean, you'll start having some adaptations immediately. You start producing more red blood cells and what have you because the oxygen molecule is more dispersed. But like to just go in, let's say somebody's like, hey, I'm gonna, for for 500 bucks a month, I'm gonna go use an altitude chamber or you know hyperbaric chamber for a certain amount of time. You're you're really not gonna get long-term benefits out of it. Um, I hate to burst that bubble, but- Okay, because let me tell you what, what what happened to me, what I saw. So have you heard of this? And you know, a little a little background. Please. I don't know much about sports. Right? <laughs> you know more than you, you know more than the average person. Well, I at this at this level in my life, in case you know you have new people who who I am, I, I do a radio show and I was always into TV and movies and Broadway musicals and West Side Story and you know that kind of stuff. And then my wife and I have three boys. And, and it, God would have it. These three boys are athletes. And so as they grow up, I'm learning about sports, but me being six, four, 250 pounds, people have always approached me and always thought I knew about the big game. They're, oh man, how about the game? I, I knew nothing about March madness. I knew nothing about football. I knew nothing about basketball, nothing. And somehow my whole life has been surrounded by sports. My first job in radio was at the mighty 690. One of the first things I ever had to do as an intern was drive Wayne Gretzky around. And I didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. Right. So Cut to now, years later, I, I have these three boys, and I'm learning as much as I can about sports, especially my, with my middle kid, who's a, a big time basketball player. Or, I mean, not big time, but he's you know an incredible athlete. So, I watch, I try to watch as much as many documentaries as I can. I've been learning so much, and which is funny because when I first met you at Exos, I was surrounded by all these athletes. Didn't have a clue who any of these people were. And what's funny is I've become friends with a handful of these guys. And still to this day, I talk to them almost all the time, but I'm jumping around. I'm very ADD. You're good. So I watched this documentary on Amazon prime a couple of weeks ago, and it's about this hockey player named Connor McGregor. Have you heard of him? A hockey player named Connor McGregor. I yeah, have, have you heard of him? No, I have not. I've heard of the, I've heard of obviously the UFC fighter. Not Connor, Connor McGregor. Sorry. Connor McDavid. Okay. Connor McDavid. I was just saying that this, this would be an interesting, I thought this was going, <laughs> sorry, no, sorry, I, sorry. I, I haven't heard of him, but that's not a surprise, right? I'm not super. Oh, really? 
I mean, like I'm, I, I have good friends that work in hockey. The Jersey you see behind me, uh, you know, Nate is a great guy. We've worked with a lot of hockey players, but I don't follow hockey actively. I have an appreciation of what it takes to get people physically ready to play that sport, but it's, you know, growing up in Nebraska, right? You, you got into football and, and things like that. So love hockey, appreciate it, but I don't follow it religiously where I'd know like everybody. Okay, so this guy, Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid. It's a it's a 45 minute documentary. It came out at Christmas time in December. You gotta watch it. Okay. So this guy, so he's 22 years old. He's like this superstar athlete. And if you're if you're it was gonna be funny about your listeners listening, going, how do they not know who Connor McDavid is? Like he's like the Michael Jordan of hockey at this time. Yeah, well, I'm an athlete. He crashes into the goalpost, destroys his kneecaps, destroys his ACL, his meniscus, everything that you hear about athletes destroying, right? And they tell him. He has two doctor's opinions. They say, you're going to have to have surgery, but if you have to have surgery, you're probably not going to skate again. Mm. And he's like, oh, shit. He goes, oh, I, I'm, I, I can't do that. And then there's a third doctor that says, hold on. Let's try something else. Hyperbaric so chamber. one of the things they do is they do all this PT and all this stuff. And they put him in the hyperbaric chamber for two hours a day for 40 days in a row. Mm. And they do MRIs on this guy. Every two weeks, they're doing an MRI. And in the two weeks, they show in the MRIs, the ligaments growing back every two weeks. They do, and they do updates and updates. So cut to, this happened in 2019, cut to like uh, a month ago, the guy just signed a hundred million dollar deal with the Edmonton Oilers. Cut to, he is stronger than he was before the accident. Cut to, it's the crazy that at the end of the documentary, when they show him going back on the skates and skating and the montage, you know, every movie needs a montage, yeah, every movie the montage of, of right. him scoring goals and getting back on the ice and being insecure about getting back on the ice. is incredible. Now here's so, the, th here's the thing though with that. Right. So mm -hmm. like hyperbaric chambers have been really shown to be effective in, uh, like cognition and in, in certain, uh, even aspects of like certain aging pieces, right? Like let's look at cognitive function though. Right. So like, mm -hmm. if you look at some of this stuff, <clears throat> there's sometimes where people have some kind of brain damage or what have you, or even if somebody's got hypoxia and they've got a, you know, some kind of accident or a drowning or what have you, where literally you have to get oxygen to the brain. Otherwise it's going to incur a lot of cell death and it's going to do it quick. When you look at uh, improvements in some cognition or the decrease in extreme medical cases, medical cases of like brain tissue dying solid, but like it, I lived in LA for a year. Right. And they'll say hyperbaric chamber, uh, this will cure this and this, and they start making 38 un unwarranted claims. Right. And so that that's the thing of like, when people look at these things as a cure all never, right. Do they have, is, is there something that can be used for it? A hundred percent. What's tricky though, John Jay is like when people look at that and they look at a story like that, and then they think that's the norm when they really don't know anything else that guy was doing from a training standpoint and a nutrition standpoint, you know, genetic variances and what have you. Right. And so some people think like, Oh, well it worked for this dude. It's going to work for me too. You know what I mean? Right. Well, so at the same time, so then here we are this year, January, my son rolls his ankle playing basketball and it's like, and it's the middle of this incredible tournament, this whole season, you know, with COVID it's been this weird thing, but in Arizona where we are, basketball has been like untouched with this certain league that he's in. Right. So he rolls, he rolls his ankle and they tell me he's going to be out like eight weeks. He uh, tore a ligament and he cracked something. And it's like, Oh crap. So I'm like, let's go hyperbaric, man. At the same time though, they did, they did this thing called, um, well, they injected him with, uh, uh, PRP. Yeah. No, the next level, the next level, uh, the stem cell. Like stem, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's the stem cell thing. So they okay. injected him in there. And then they said, let's do hyperbaric. So they, we did hyperbaric a, a couple times, three or four times a week. I was doing it with him. He was supposed to be out eight weeks. And in, in the doctors, some doctor said, oh, that's hocus pocus. In two and a half weeks, the doctor looked at the MRI and was like, oh my God, they were blown away. But is it the hyperbaric or was it the stem cell? Well, and it's always, you know what I mean? yeah. And for anybody that doesn't know what we're nerding out about, like what, what we're talking about hyperbaric there, it's like the administration of pure oxygen, right? Pure oxygen. Mm. And uh, like, so like literally, uh, and, and the body typically absorbs 98%, give or take, you know, uh, oxygen in general. So like when somebody breathes in pure oxygen, getting that other 2%, and this is where it gets tricky. So we don't go like a physiology rabbit hole in most things in life. If you have an increase in 1%, 2%, like you'll still take it right. Like marginal gains, this, this stuff seems cool. And, and obviously some, some increase is better than none, but what, what most research shows is like, Literally, if the body's naturally uptaking 98% oxygen saturation, what have you, that little 2% generally doesn't make a, a, a big enough, like it doesn't make a huge difference. So when you see athletes a lot of times taking oxygen on the sidelines, like I remember growing up watching Nebraska play Miami and Warren Sapp had to get on oxygen 
really what goes on a lot of the times there is it's less the oxygen because he's already up taking 98%. And it's more the fact that he's now inhaling deeply, exhaling, right? He's controlling mm -hmm. his breathing. So like, but when somebody has oxygen levels at, or gets oxygen at greater than atmospheric pressure, right? They start thinking, all right, well, can this help with sports injuries? You know, be, at least as a primary or adjunct treatment. Now, like I said, some results have been proven to be effective, but it's only as good as everything else you do around it, right? The issue is when people think that in and of itself is going to solve its problems. And that's where I thought at the beginning, I thought you were even talking about altitude training. So the inverse of this, right? Like, uh, because that's something that people will do too. John Jay is they'll say, right. Hey, we want to mimic the effects of altitude. So we're going to go hypobaric and, uh, it's just tricky. You have to have a smart kind of thing around that. And then also listen, the placebo effect is real. So I'm not saying right. it's bunk. I'm saying it won't solve everything by itself. But okay. So side note, or let me just shift gears real quick. Do you it. are so smart, dude, your book, your book. I mean, you sent me you your book, book right when I think when it came out, right? But what lying. I did the other day, I went through your book when you first sent it. And I was like, you know, this is a really thick book for someone like me. So I actually downloaded it. I bought the audio book. And I'm like, first of all, how come you're not reading it? Do you want to know the actual answer to that? Yeah. So we, we actually applied to read it. We wanted to do it. Audible, because you got to remember I self-published, right? So I didn't have a publisher that gave me an advance and hooks you up with a studio and all this. So Audible is like, all right, man, well, here you go. You have to meet these recording studio standards. You have to have the, the decibel levels at a certain amount. And I once listened to an episode of you on your show talking about you don't even know how to work Google Drive, right? So like Google Drive and Dropbox, you had to have help with that. Well, they're telling me, yeah. they're telling me that I have to have everything perfect audio. I have to edit it. I have to do all these things. I have no access to, you know, I had no access to a home recording studio. Like literally if an airplane went overhead right now, I would have had to have clapped to spike the audio. And then I'd have to go back. I'd do all my recording, soundproofing, editing. <laughs> and, and dude, I, you know, at the time I, I did that book, you know, I was still just coaching athletes going across the world. I, I was time poor. So then Audible is like, well, if you can't afford to do it, you know, and you can't do it meeting our standards, you have to choose an Audible approved editor, which I never knew that, man. Like, I didn't know that your favorite author or my favorite author, generally, their literary agent connects them with a studio. It's all paid for. You know, they go to a recording studio, certain like Kevin Hart, right? Narrates his own right. book. Kevin Hart gets hooked up with that. That's part of the process. Sure. Low level people like me are told like, hey, go buddy, buy a microphone on Amazon. Good luck. And we'll tell you if we like sure. it or not. Well, I got to tell you, you, when you say low level of reading that book and the quality of the book and the content of the book certainly is not low level. I mean, you, I first of all, you use words like nomenclature and alchemy. <laughs> yeah, listen, who, who's in the broadcasting hall of fame between us, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't use words like that. You don't no, need it's, to. seriously, you, it's incredible content. And it's funny because your book, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing how the universe works and puts us and connects us because I'm literally going through like a lot of the stuff that's in your book, you know, about communication and, and talking to staff, you know, our staff's always changing, not always changing, but right now I'm going through a big change with a, a lot of crew members and stuff. And so learning how to talk to people and communicate, especially with the different generations, you know, I'm Gen X. And then, you know, you're probably, you're a millennial and now I got to deal with Gen Z. It's just a different world. Well, and that leads into something I wanted to ask you, right? So I, and, and we've never really got a chat like this. You and I always just kind of cross paths on the training floor. We got to bullshit a little bit, but I didn't know you had a background in improv and you were in the groundlings. And so yeah, yeah. where this ties in and where I'd like to love a little bit more about that is uh, like within that, right. You've got to bounce off of different people improv. So I, some people think it's just whose line is it anyway, right? They don't get what it really is. So with your staff coming in and switching and the dynamics that you guys have to play off of with each other and guests, talk to me a little bit about how like you've managed that over the years. Like that, that's hard, man. Like to be able to, to manage the social dynamics and egos and attitudes and agendas. And I don't mean those in a bad way, just everybody kind of has their own way of operating. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, it's really, it's really hard except for on the radio. We're on such a time crunch now, you know, with, uh, fortunately, the show has been so successful, but we do have a lot more commercials. So we only have a short window to, to get to stuff. So there's not a lot of room for that much improv. Sometimes we'll tape a lot of stuff, but when it comes to improv with the groundlings and improv on the radio, the evolution of improv on the radio has changed. So with the groundlings, they used to say, you do do as much as you can, right? And everyone would improv a scene, improv a scene, improv a scene. And then when you're just out of ideas and it's the most uncomfortable thing in the world, that's when the genius happens. Yeah. That's when the gold comes up. But with radio, I don't have time for that. And listeners don't have time for that. Listeners not going to sit around and wait 30 seconds for you something to happen. But so if you tape something, 
a lot of times we're taping segments and we let the silence hit and then we can edit out the uncomfortableness later, but ah, still leave enough uncomfortable. You know, that's yeah. how we, the beauty of radio, but with the personalities though, it, it's so different to manage personalities, especially with the different generations, but man, it's just so that's actually your book has been helping me a lot. Quite frankly, it's so it's amazing that we're talking to you right now that I'm talking to you right now. In fact, I'm one of those guys who say we know that. I mean, I'm that I'm talking to you right now. I'm um, actually, uh, have a guy, actually my strength and conditioning coach. He also is a, he does these personality tests and I'm bringing him in to, to coach our crew to take these tests of, to figure out how to talk to one another. You know, he said, it's like the five love languages with personalities. So-and-so might need more time, might need more words of affirmation. And this person might need more quality time. And this person might need, you know, speak differently to them. So it's, it's, it's just a, it's so complicated. And me as a manager, I'm learning how to talk to people. Cause back in the day, you know, I'd be like, Hey, I need five copies of this, but now you got to be like, Hey, yeah. Do you have to, can, can you make five copies of this for me, please? I need this. Meanwhile, the song is running out in 10 seconds. Yeah. And I don't have, like back in the day, it's like songs run out. Hey, I need five copies. Go, go. Now it's going to be, hey, I'm going to need five. Or, or I got to really plan ahead and be like, I think, uh, you know, I get there, I get to work around 420, 430. In the morning. And I'll be, and yeah, in the morning. And I, and I have the whole show mapped out. And then I know, you know, shows take a left turn all the time, but I'm trying to think in advance of where things can go. It's, 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 it goes a little bit against improv, but I try to map. It's like a controlled chaos. It's yeah. Well, it's, a, it's like, know. it's regulated improv like this, you know, and like, here's, here's the interesting thing, man, that's fascinated me about you is, and, uh, you know, you interview a lot of high level celebrities, but you also will talk to average Joe and Janes and, and people like myself and what have you. And like you said, you've got to be able to, to balance this, but you also, one thing that I supremely respect about you is you don't dodge difficult shit. And like, given that the nature of this podcast, like in a lot of coaching and leadership podcasts, it's a lot of wishy-washy stuff, you know? And so I was like, well, if we're going to do something, we're going to have people on that, that don't go skirt around the edges. I mean, you talk about topics related to sex and bullying and life and finance and, you know, people's insecurities or arguments with their, like, you'll go, you don't, there's no limit to where you go. Like within how you've navigated your career, was that like, were you able to kind of make your mark like that from the jump, you know, or was that something where it's like, Hey, I know I got to craft a persona, obviously, you know, you're you, but there's got to be elements of your persona that are amplified. How did you kind of figure out your voice, your identity and your approach so that you don't fall flat when you interview these kinds of people? Well, honestly, uh, what I, my, my whole way of doing the radio show, let's see quick little background. So when I was dating my wife back in the day, and we, you know, I was in radio sales. So I, I interned and then I got into promotions and then I got into radio sales because you know, that's where the guys were making all the money. But my entire life, I wanted to be on the radio. That's what I always wanted to do. I mean, I have tapes when I was a little kid. I always wanted to be on the radio. But when I got into my, my early 20s and I was dating my wife and I was unhappy being a radio sales guy, she said to me, she's like, she was, what do you want to do? I said, well, there's two things I'd like to do. I like to have my own radio show. And I go, but that's impossible because I'm already 23, 24 years old. And to have my own radio show, I got to go to Kentucky and I got to go do overnights, midnight to five. And then I got to get promoted to the midday job. And then from midday job, you get afternoons from afternoons. And then once you're, you know, 35, you get the morning show in a city. Then you got to be successful there. Then you get maybe LA or New York. Yeah. I didn't go that route. So with her, she said, she goes, what, what is the other option? I go, well, I like to maybe write. I like to write or perform for Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's she my goes, dream, man. So she's like, how do you go about that? So we backtracked from, sh my wife sat there with a pen and pencil, backtracked, Saturday Night Live, and we went backwards. How do you get there? And that's how I got to the groundlings. So like Will Ferrell was a groundling. Lisa yep. Kudrow was a groundling. Conan O'Brien was a groundling. You know, or you go to Chicago, New Second City. So I went and I auditioned for the groundlings. Now, long story short, my old boss, the one that had me drive Wayne Gretzky around, he moved to Cincinnati and he was running the top 40 show, a top 40 radio station in Cincinnati. I was now doing improv with the groundlings on the weekends and I was doing a local troupe in San Diego. I was doing local stuff almost every day. And he calls me and he says, Hey, this is going to sound crazy, but we are looking to blow up our morning show and we want someone funny who's never been in radio or on the radio. Would you come out and audition? And I was like, I mean, it's like, I just told you about the universe, the way the universe works. So right. long story short, I got the job at Cincinnati and I got my own morning show never being on the radio, I got my own morning show at the age of 27. Incredible. So that's how, so that's how I started it all because of my wife saying, what's your goal? Let's go backwards from there. And what I thought I was writing out my goal to be a writer for Saturday Night Live, I ended up getting my own morning show, which is the ultimate goal for me. Right. Yeah. So, so that's how, that's how I started 
getting my own show. Then from Cincinnati, I went to Houston. From Houston, I went back to Arizona. And so from there, so your question was, I, I hope I answered it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I got, you're, I was yeah you're, you're, you're on a great stream of consciousness here. I am not going to interrupt you. So it was kind of, yes, how, how you got started within that and then how you managed to be able to, uh, you know, play like the people that you have to interview so many dynamic, oh. yeah, go ahead. You got oh, it. Oh, here's, here's how I was getting, you're saying, how do I, how do, okay. So in that times, never being my own, having my own, never being on the radio before I had to study and I had to research everybody. So who's the greatest radio personality of all time? Uh, well, that's Howard, Howard Stern. Stern. Yeah. Howard Stern. So at that time, when I got my own show, I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to do a radio show. And my dad was living in San Diego. My dad's taping the top 40 show on cassettes. And he's sending me these cassettes every day. And I'm trying to listen to Howard Stern. And meanwhile, Howard drops his movie, Private Parts. I love that I movie. Yeah, I love that movie. And I read the book, Private Parts. And in the movie, there's this scene where Howard's at the gas station with his wife. And he says to her, he goes, listen, Allison, for me to be successful, for me to really win, because I have to be open and honest about everything. I have to be authentic about everything. This is like 1996, 1997. That's just when I started. And so I said to my wife, I said, you see this? I go, this is what I have to do. I have to do this. But he's in rock and roll. I'm in top 40. I'm going to do that for the women. I'm going to be that for the women audience, for Smart. our women demographic. I'm going to be as open and as honest as I can about my insecurities, about man boobs, about my double chin, about the cut on my lip, about my receding hairline, about every single thing. I think if I could, if I could relate to the lowest common denominator as far as your insecurity, right. I, I can just form a connection with everybody. And so what happened was I started getting people saying to me, oh my God, you're saying what I'm thinking. You said what I'm thinking. That's exactly what I'm thinking. And I was like, holy crap, this is working. And I was just being as real as I possibly could. And well, that's, that's, that was always my theory. So it's, I got it from Howard Stern. And the piece of that I like is that's true differentiation, right? Differentiation isn't like, oh, I'm going to be different. I'm going to go and try to outdo this, or I'm going to try to compete with Howard Stern. It's saying, hey, I see what's worked here. I'm going to take elements of that and fuse that with who I really am and then exactly. serve, serve an unserved audience. And also it's funny too, because I hear this word a lot right now. Uh, this is like the buzzword right now uh, in 2020, 2021, but it's been my buzzword forever is being as authentic as possible. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be as authentic as possible. You can talk, I, people can read through that. I listen to other radio shows now. And, and when I listen, you just see that guy's lying. That guy, that's not true. This person's not telling the true story. You know tell? what I mean? What's the tell? Tell me how, you, what's the tell? Because there's not a follow up when you, when you, when you, when someone says uh, they, they say something and you ask a question and there's no, there, there's just more, you can tell they're not painting the radio's theater of the mind. And when someone's telling a story on the radio and they don't paint enough of the picture, I don't believe them. Yeah. And I think the audience is the same way. Yeah. Well, listen, that, that shit was the case with athletes, right? Like, and it's been forever since you and I have talked, but just like kind of, you talked about, you know, how you started and then how you evolved and what have you. It's the same thing. You knew me when I just trained athletes and now we do work with corporations. We do work with the military. We do work with all these things. And we actually use elements of improv in teaching people how to coach because coach coaching, like, you know, like human interaction, there's, you may have an idea of where certain things are going to go, but you never know how somebody's going to respond, right? Like you'd see me lead these groups of guys that they couldn't look more different than me. They're from different places. Like it's constantly trying to figure out what makes them tick, what does this, but there's a lot of people that just want a structured way. So to your point, it is funny when people talk about being authentic, but they're just giving a scripted version of what they want the audience to, to know. That's not being authentic. Right. That's like regulated disclosure. Like I'm giving you this. I'm not going to tell you the rest. And I think, do you think a lot of it now too is, I mean, inherently people are scared of being judged and they want to belong and be liked and bullshit. But like, do you think people are even more frightened of that now because of like cancel culture and everything? They're kind of freaked yes. out at what might come back. Absolutely, man. And sometimes I get scared. I don't get scared when I'm sharing my honest thoughts, but I get scared sometimes on what I'm posting on social media sometimes because that's where they come at you. Those keyboard bullies come it's at you. Brutal. you know? It's brutal. brutal. But, but, I know. You, but you man, it. Well, go ahead. I, I cut you off. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I just said the, the keyboard bullies come at you. And, and those are the ones like I had, I, in fact, I've, I'm actually dealing with this still to this day. A couple of years ago, I got into a, the keyboard bullies came at me and they still, they, they, an army of them came after me because of a, a band. I got into a fight with a, a fan base of a band and I thought it was funny and it turned into a disaster. And now they've, they've red flagged every single one of my posts and I got shadow banned from Instagram and I've had to head I heart has it had that talk to Instagram. Oh, Instagram wow. to, I mean, it's been two years. It's crazy. Yeah. That is. But, and, and if I remember correctly and, and literally call me out on the air, if it's not your wife's name's Blake. Right. Okay. And so like with that, you, you obviously disclose a lot on the air. You got three boys, right? 
I have three boys. Three yeah. boys, right? So you have Blake, three boys. Uh, you're, you're, uh, we're going to talk about everything you do with Love Pup and 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 rescues and and dogs and everything too. But like, you have to disclose a lot. Where do you draw the line, if at all, of like what you'll share about you versus what you share about your family? Like, how much do you let your audience in on the family life? I know on social media, I always see the the posts of your kids playing basketball. I love that, especially when you go at crazy parents. Oh my god, mm-hmm. that's my favorite oh, yeah. post when you go at batshit crazy parents. By the way, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so, amazing. Parents are basketball parents are crazy. <laughs> I draw the line now with like my oldest son. He wants almost no part of anything posted on social media. Uh, you know, he's not. Yeah, he doesn't want. He changes his Instagram account all the time because listeners reach out to him and stuff. And so I got to respect his privacy. Um, my two younger kids don't really care. Um, my wife, she hasn't got mad at me in a long time. Sometimes I've crossed the line. I can't remember the last time, but she'd be like, Hey, that's private. <laughs> Usually the rule I have, or that we have in my family is that we could, we, everything's fair game on the air, unless my wife says, okay, this isn't for the radio. Mm. And then if she says that, then I, I respect that and I don't do it, you know? But that hasn't happened in a long time, I think. Yeah, man. Know? Well, and anybody that's listened to your show, I mean, I, I want to know what Blake would be like, this isn't for radio because you push some boundaries. Uh, like, but I do. She texted me today, as a matter of fact. She texted me this morning. She's she's at our, we have a, a vacation cabin up north. My kids have been skiing, my, my oldest and my youngest with her. And she texted me today and she's like, Hey, I'm really excited to come home. I miss you. I miss our hugs. And she goes on about something. She goes, I'd really like some sex tonight. <laughs> and I was like, right. And I thought I should screenshot that and post it. And I'm like, no, she's going to get mad. And I was like, I don't, and I don't want my kids to read that. To know, you know what I mean? So that's where my brain goes now. And I thought, really, what am I getting out of that? Some people are going to go, oh, I love the way you guys love each other. And I thought, I don't need that. So I just didn't, my brain already went through the whole process and I thought I'm not going to post it. So I, I didn't post it, but hopefully I'll get sex tonight. Yeah. I mean, I hope so as well. Yeah. It is a, it is a Thank delicate, you. it is a delicate balance. That's for sure. Cause like I found, I mean, the evolution here, and I don't know who knows if I've done a good job of it or not, but like a lot of how I got got my following initially was, you know, just through athlete training and people like seeing that stuff on Instagram. Right. But then eventually, like, as we switch gears and we went more into psychology, behavior change, communication, you know, Instagram, it's going to take a hit. And you mm-hmm. can be like, oh, well, I need to start posting this. And it's like, no, that's not where we're going with that direction. You know, and so we, we try to stay in our lane. And then I also show some aspects of my personal life. But like sometimes people will be like, hey, what are your thoughts on this and that? I'll go 99% of places. But there's some things like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to show my house. You know, I'm not going to show mm-hmm. like the outside of my house. And that's just because there's creepy people out there. You know, like I'll show Bronson. I'll show our, you know, we got a 14 month old and what have you. But there's, there's a mix because Liz sometimes will like judo kick me if I'm like, hey, this would be a good picture. But you're right, man. It is, it is a unique thing, but at the same time, relationships make like what you go through in life. It's all content, right? It's all content. Mm-hmm. And you want to share those things because people can't say, Oh my God, John Jay, you know, what's going on in my head. If you, if you are so closed off about the whole range of who you are, cause they don't want to just know you as the morning show host. They want to know like, right. who are you as a family guy? Right. Well, you're right. And plus radio is so competitive now. So a lot of shows and what I realized about a lot of my competitors, their shows over a 10, and they're done. They put their headphones up and they're done. I try to keep my show going after 10 on social media. Smart. So I have a different way of looking at it. You know what I mean? So my, my radio show is over at 10, but then what? Get on social media and you can see what else is going on. And then I might recap that tomorrow on the air, but I have a whole other story going. So when you say you don't show your house, I totally get that. But for me, I, I got, I'm competing with a guy in New York. I'm competing with a guy in Portland. I'm competing with a guy in LA. I got, I'm, you know, I'm all over the country and I've got, it's crazy. So I'm trying to show as much as I can to give different, I'm trying to show content that can't be duplicated because there's so many people out there that are taking our ideas and using them and repackaging them and it kills me. So I'm trying to show stuff that nobody else can do. Yeah. That makes sense. No. Yeah. It makes total sense. And I'll, and again, I'll show aspects of my house. I just don't show like, Hey, here's outside what it looks like in case you're crazy and you want to roll by and try to kill me. You know what I mean? I I try not to do that either because I've already have, I've had the crazies are crazy. They are crazy, but but let's talk about you for a second, Brad, because I have to tell you something. I'm so impressed. I don't know if you remember this, but like the first day I met you, the first day I remember laying on the ground, we were stretching and talking to you. And I said to you, I go, dude, you're going to be huge. There's something very special about you. Do you remember that? I, yeah, I do. I'm by the way, I'm still not huge. So you're not, you're not right in that regard, but no. you were one of the first ones to believe in me without a doubt. When everybody was telling me kind of like, Oh, just stay here. Say you got a good thing and whatever you, you were very much like, what the hell are you still doing here? You know, in a respectful yeah. way, you know, I remember dude. And then I remember when you said, Hey, let me get your opinion on something. You were like, 
I got this offer to go to the Miami Dolphins, or I got this offer to maybe own my own, be part of the owner of a gym in LA. Yeah. And I was like, if I were you, I'd go to LA because then you own part of the gym. Yeah. And then I know you went to LA and now oh, that was for a little bit. And then you went to, then you ended up, are you in Atlanta? Is that where you are yeah, now? Yeah, we went to Atlanta after the book, after the book took off, you know, we moved to Atlanta to kind of start our own thing. And, and, and uh, this, you know, we, LA is a great place, but that's not where you want to raise a family, right? Like at least right. for me. And so, uh, Atlanta was a strategic move based on a lot of speaking and what have you, huge international mm -hmm. airport, kind of Midwesty, whatever. So, yeah. So are you still there? Yeah. I mean, I live an hour outside of the city. So we live in a small town called Woodstock. We lived in the city of Atlanta. Like literally if you landed, we're like, we would have been 15 minutes from the airport. Now we live out in the cut. Cause we had two rescues, right? Bleeding into something right. I know you're super passionate about. We had a rescue pit bull, rescue Vishla, Liz, my wife was a soldier and she kind of put up with a lot of different moves. And so she was like, yo, I want, I want a yard again. I want this. And then you know, to not lose my mind, I wanted a garage gym that I've been trying to build for like 12 years. And so you got more bang for your buck, got out in the country. And plus, man, like, I don't know if you're like this. I'd love to know is you know, I don't mind being on when we're doing this or when I'm speaking or what have you, but there's gotta be a time of day where I'm just off. And so I mm -hmm. got to get out of the city where like nobody knows me and, and, and I'm not bothered. And, and so, yeah, we live outside of the, the city of Atlanta now. That's great. That's yep. great. I remember, dude, I remember, didn't you propose in Australia on a bridge? You got a good memory. You've done, see, I don't buy it. You've done research. I heard in one of your interviews, you don't do research. You do. Research. I don't do any research. That's a, is that in a book? Did yeah. you put that in your book? No, it's on my Instagram. Uh, and I swear the, to God, I swear to God on my life. In I, fact, okay. Is this in your, in your book where you said, or, or Instagram, where you were going to invite me to the bachelor party in Vegas and you uh, forgot to, because that, that didn't happen. You know what? That is so full of shit. You're extremely hard. To, I, how long was I texting you to get on this show or even me to come on your podcast until you're like, Hey no, man, I'm talking about like, no, your bachelor party in Vegas. Well, you, can, you remember that? Yeah, you were said, Hey, that, it was in February. Am I right? Uh, I should, I'd have to ask Pat Chung. He was the one that threw it. You know, he's you were like, Hey, my, my best party in Vegas. Come? it was me. And it was that dude that, that you it was me supposed to be me and that huge football guy we used to work out with. You decided not to come. You decided not to go. <laughs> you, you decided not to come. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a good, like, listen, I, I think of you often with that is, um, it, it can get tough. And I imagine this is, it's interesting when you talk about your new staff and what have you, I'd be interested to see what you look for, but it gets tough when you go out and you do something that you perceive as bold, whether other people do or not like to, to find people that appreciate that sense of risk, that sense of openness, that sense of these things. And, uh, you were one of the first ones that did that, man. And so, you know, I value you and that's why I've continued to kind of follow what you do. I listen to John Jay and Rich on demand and, and I'm not a pop culture guy, but I listen because Dude, just the way you interact and, and you're such a master of it. You have this balance of like, you're obviously very savvy. You're a great communicator, but you also bring this kind of self-deprecating aloofness that gets people to open up and not in a disingenuous way, right? In a way that just kind of like, there's this sense of comfort and uh, yeah, you're an interesting person to study who's influenced me in many ways. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. It's like I told you that for some reason, sports has been around my whole life, right? And I'm a non-athlete, but, you know, working out with you, I remember working out in many of these groups with you where with pro athletes, right? And I'm not a pro athlete, but I remember I got so into it. I got so involved. In it. it was so much fun for me to go work out in your groups. I don't know if you remember how many times I worked out in your groups, but it was, in fact, I'm still friends with a handful of these guys from your group, you know, go train, um, go train with you, go to Vegas with them. You go train with them. What are have they been on the show? I've had, I've gone, I mean, to go to dinner with them. I've gone out a couple of, I, I don't really like to go out. You know, I'm not that big of a social guy, sure. but this, this is a big thing I do. I'm like excited. I get these moments of excitement. Like, yeah, let's go Friday night. Let's go. And then like, we make plans to go out Friday night and then Friday night. I'll be like, Hey man, it looks like it might rain. And then I don't go, you yeah, know, but yeah. I like the vibe of wanting to go out with everybody, but then I don't go. Well, you know, but this, this is what I want to know is because, and, and you mentioned a little bit of radio magic, right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't have, I admittedly peek behind the curtains. Like we don't have a producer that like can do a lot of magic. This is pretty raw, unfiltered. We have a guy that generally will help if, if there's a huge audio noise or what have you, but it's not like uh, guy Raz NPR where they have 15 people on staff or like Rogan where they have like 20 people that can cut and splice and do this and what have you. We keep this pretty raw. Um, but like with that radio magic, have you ever just bombed on the air? Have you ever just blown an interview or somebody just like uh, they, oh, they yeah. shut down? Talk to yeah. me about one of those times. Yeah, we bomb all the time, but like, like I will ask, I, like I said, I don't like to do research. I, I, there's something to me, this is the best way to describe my interviews. And this is maybe this is bad, but like, I look at it, like, let's say I, I, I was flying to Los Angeles and I'm sitting on the Southwest Airlines flight and I'm sitting next to the person. I look at, and by the time I land in LA, which is an hour flight, I have an hour to learn as much as I can about this person. So I start talking to this person and that's, I don't have a book on this person before I get on the plane. Right. So that's my own philosophy. That's nobody else's philosophy. So 
when I, but it's, it's bit me in the ass a few times. Like I remember one time we were, in, I was in Vegas and we were doing our show from Vegas and they bring by all these people. They brought, they brought by the Goo Goo Dolls, just to give you the timeframes, like 2004 or yeah. something like that. The Goo Goo Dolls, they brought back all these artists were coming by and they kept making some comment about, yeah, you know, we sing our music live. You know, our music is live. And I was like, okay, great. The next artist came by and they were like, I think it was like Snoop Dogg. She was like, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I do my stuff live. You know, it's not taped. And I'm like, all right, I get it. Thanks, and, then, yeah. and after a while, I was like, what the hell is going on? Why is everybody keep doing that? And I get on online and that's the day, it was like Sunday morning. And it was right after Ashley Simpson got busted lip syncing. Oh, I remember, I remember that. And that yeah. thing was massive. Yeah. And I was so mad at myself for not opening up a computer. Not, and I was so mad at my crew for not, nobody knew. How, like, how do you not tell the host of the show that the biggest thing in the world is Ashley Simpson got caught lip syncing, performing live on Saturday Night Live, and she wasn't live. So some, a lot of times that's, you know, or I, I will say, I remember interviewing Quinn Latifah and I said something about, hey, uh, that was so great when you had Danny DeVito on your, on your video lip syncing. And she's like, Danny DeVito? She's like, what are you talking about? And I got in this whole argument with her about, and I got into an argument with Puff Daddy. I could have swore Puff Daddy was a backup dancer on a Brian, on a, um, who's a, on a Bobby Brown video. Now listen, that, like, that's a legitimate thing. Puff Daddy, anybody that knows hip hop, that dude does not quit dancing in his videos. That dude, right. dances, he might as well be a backup dancer. I said, I, uh, what's that like? You're a, you're a backup dancer in a Bobby Brown video back in the day. And he's like, no, I wasn't. I'm like, yeah, you were. And I get into this argument with him and I was wrong. Right. I, well, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. But that's the thing is I, if I would have done the research, but the, at the same time then I wouldn't have these golden nuggets of audio to play where we can make fun of me. Now I'm not doing it on purpose. It's honest. You know, it's the, these are real, real honest flubs on our show that happen all the time. But I also, now I can't, you can't escape information now. So everywhere you go, like, you know, like Selena Gomez today said she doesn't want to, if she's not taken seriously anymore, she didn't get out of music. So if I had Selena Gomez on the show, uh, I wouldn't, I would, I would know what to ask her. But now, nowadays, quite frankly, just to get to talk about celebrities, I actually don't like interviewing celebrities anymore. So we, we try not to. If we do any interviews with celebrities, I usually just push them out on a podcast. I just don't find celebrities. I think celebrities are full of it now. I don't think they tell the truth. When you were asking me about being authentic, I don't think hardly almost none of these celebrities are authentic on the interviews. They give you five minutes to talk to a celebrity and you can ask them these questions and that's it. Don't ask them about this. Don't ask them about that. And I'm like, oh, well, then I don't need to talk to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So oh. no, I, I, I can have the number one show in the country without, without talking to a celebrity. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to piggyback off that, I'd say the same thing about coaches, you know, like you hear all the time coaches be like, Oh, I'm in it for the athlete. I'm in it for this. And, and it's got like, they have this script of things that they do. And I'm like, all right, dude, give me the real person. Give me the real person. Give me the real person. But like, they all think they need to be John Wooden or they all think they need to be a servant based leader and what have you. And it's like, well, first of all, people don't relate to that, you know, all the time. Like people need some different shit, you know, and, and you have to be attuned to stuff. Now, here's the thing that trips me up about the research thing. Cause I thought about this with you, right? Whether you want to admit it on air or not, you're kind of a big deal. I mean, you're, you're a legend in many respects. Nobody has a lifetime free access to Chipotle card and is not a big deal. Yeah. You didn't think I forgot about that shit. Didn't you? Uh, uh, did you that's, that's good. Yeah, remember that. yeah, yeah. I'm, I remember everything, but like, here's the thing, you know, I always want, uh, a guest that comes on the show to be a little bit surprised and be like, damn dude, you answered some, you asked some good questions. You had some things that I didn't see coming and you actually took an interest in me, which I did. But then I went, I went back and forth a lot with you, John Jay. There's things that I knew just cause I knew, right? Like you're everything with, with what you do for rescues and your charities and your foundations and what have you. But I felt like, man, it's a thin line. I want to ask him. I just want to be able to go back and forth with him. Cause I think we can banter well. So we are okay. like, we're, we're bantering. I didn't structure this, but now I run the risk of if I didn't ask you anything original, did I blow my shot with a good friend that I highly respect, you know? And uh, so there's that piece. And then there's also the piece of this, right? Like you have to think about uh, when you when you engage with somebody, there's always gonna be this question that you wish, they wish you asked them. And maybe they don't even know what it is yet. It's kind of in this subconscious or what have you. But you do a lot of interviews, you're on the air a lot. There's some things you don't get to talk about. Uh, I wanna know what those things are. And I'd rather hear it from you than read it in your bio or do this or do how, like, what, what is the one question people wish ask you, you, like you wish people ask you more and, and what makes somebody conversationally stand out to you where you as an experienced broadcaster, are like that person gets it. That person has something. What do I wish someone like, so what question do I wish you would ask me? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be me, man. Like there's something that you wish, like literally, like I wish people would, uh, I, this would be a refreshing friggin' question, right? Like this would be something that I'd like to, to, to rap about a little bit. What is that? Topically, it or whatever. It's, topically is probably about fatherhood. Okay. Probably. I like to talk 
about that more than uh, that's 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 the greatest thing of all time. But that that to me, but that's not. I don't know. I just love. I could talk about being a dad all day long. That's the greatest thing of all time. But that's that's about it, probably. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, I'm going to give but you. I a- also think I, I don't know if that's a tune out to people, you know, because I love. I just think being a dad every single day is a complete joy. That's not you know, a tune I'm, out, man. That's not a tune no. out to anybody, you know, especially this audience. Not at all. Like for me, I, I, I you know, I write down my, I, I write down daily goals. I write down, you know, I got weekly goals. I have yearly goals. I have, really? I have emotional, emotional goals. And I have, I, you know, I, every day I, I write down what I'm grateful for every day. And then I have, this, I have strange rituals. Like I drive in the morning to work in the dark at four o'clock in the morning in silence. But I out loud, I kind of pray, but I also out loud go over what I'm grateful for. Mm-hmm. So out loud, I say the things that I'm grateful for from a certain point in my house, from when I pull out of the driveway, I actually go over these numbers I have. I have these numbers that if you say these numbers in a certain order, they bring you joy. It opens up the universe to bring you joy. Then I drive to a certain point and I go, I say out loud all the things I'm grateful for. My wife, Blake, my sons, Jake Kemp and Dutch. And then I go over other things that I'm grateful for. My, my listeners, my audience, my health, you know, these things. And I say all these things out loud. Then I go over the great things that I would like to happen today. Then I give myself these words of affirmation and I talk about, uh, you know, my ranking. I, I'm, I have the, I'm the number one show in this city. I'm the number one show. I've never told anybody this. I'm the number one show in this city. I'm the number one show in the, you know, I say these affirmations out loud to make them true. And then I, as I park the car, I go over my confidence and I tell myself that I'm funny, that I'm talented, that I'm creative, that I'm a leader, that I'm a good husband, that I'm a good father. So those are, those are some of the things I do. Those are my absolutely daily rituals, no matter what happens Monday through Friday. Every day without fail. Every day. Through Friday. It actually starts when I get up in the morning that I, I gave you part two, part one happens. I have a hot tub and in the morning, in the morning I get up and I do a little workout on the Peloton at 3 a.m. I do the either 20 minute or 30 minute workout on the Peloton. Then I sit in the hot tub outside in the darkness and I meditate. It's like, it's like my, it's like a, a cleansing, a Buddhist. It's my own little thing about, I'm just in peace, absolute peace. And there I pray. And there I thank God for I'm grateful for all the great things in my life. And there I pray for other people. And there are certain specific people I know that have lost kids or that are, that are very close to me uh, that have gone through tragedies. I pray for them. Then I get out of there and I have a cold plunge, like the one at Exos, but I keep mine colder. I had it built about three, four years ago and I keep it at 40 degrees Ooh. and I jump, I jump in the cold plunge for a, a, probably a minute, maybe two minutes. I sit in that cold plunge for a while. And this is all in the and morning. I, this is all, this is all before four, before three forty five in the morning. And then, and then I, and then on the drive is at 4 a.m. I get dressed between three forty five and four. Yeah. And then at 4 a.m. is when I start the second ritual. I told you I want to pull out of the driveway. So w- within that, first of all, what time, I, I'm going to ask the obvious, what time do you go to bed? That's my problem. That's why I have this thing right here. I don't know if you can see that. I have this aura ring someone told me to get yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Track my, to track my sleep. And I have horrible sleep patterns. I, I have sleep apnea for one. So two, I, I, I go to sleep around 10 and I wake up, I wake up at 245 and I try to, even back in the Exos days when Joel, Joel used to say, you need to sleep more, go to bed at six. I'm like, dude, I got little kids. I can't go to sleep. So I try, like, I try to go to bed. I tried to go to bed at, uh, last night at seven. And then I got this text. Somebody sent me this video of my son. My son had 22 points in a basketball in the second half of a basketball game the other night. And was I was watching camp? the video and I was like, this is amazing video. Oh my God. And I had to edit it and I put music to it. And I was like all excited, you know? So I, next thing you know, it was nine 15. You know, and then I wanted to jerk off and then I went to sleep. <laughs> hey, man, listen, you have better health habits, sands to sleep than, than probably 90% of the athletes that, I, that I've worked with. And, and even myself, right? Like I've even learned over the past few years of my life as my job has changed and the business has grown or we've met, you know, different circumstances with COVID, like sleep, sleep and stress management are my number one and two worst things, you know? And I try to have certain routines and what have you, but I kind of have to, every day is so radically different. But like you said, you have to, you have to have some anchors, right? And yeah, uh, man, you got to meditate. You got to, you got to, the, the mental health thing. I've been a bit, that's another thing why I like the hyper, I do the hyperbaric chamber whenever I can just for myself. Cause what I do in that hyper 90 minutes is I take a nap. Yep. You know, it's a solid 90 minutes. And if it's, if it's pumping somehow some anti-aging stuff in me, I'll take it. A hundred percent. And then how many dogs you have? We have eight dogs of our own. They're, they're, they're called foster failures. They were all dogs. They were supposed to go somewhere else, but we all fell in love with them. So we kept them. Yeah. We have a dog rescue, uh, you know, it's called love pup foundation. And we have right. We about three years ago, I bought a building 
And we started to remodel it all by volunteers and people volunteering, you know, construction workers, builders, architects. And we're literally, we bought it three years ago and it's literally opening maybe in five days or less. You know, it's taking that long. Within that, like how many dogs, and I know it's an estimate, right? Like you probably, uh, there's no way to like probably keep track to the point, or maybe there is, I don't know. How many dogs have you helped find like quote unquote forever homes through Love Pup? I would say thousands. I did an interview with People Magazine uh, the first year or two that we did it. And at that time it was about 500 and that was five years ago, I think. So I would say we're at thousands and I wanted to, again, make sure you knew that I did an interview with People Magazine. Yeah, well, noted. And we'll make sure that we have that in the intro. I'll make sure to yeah, impress upon everybody. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll, we'll impress upon everybody that this guy did an interview with People uh, Magazine. We have, and so was, like- It was only online, but I think that's more important than the magazine. I think that's anyway. what, and, and by the way, you thought I was going to miss this. What the hell were you talking about when you used to drive Wayne Gretzky around? You thought I missed that. Oh, I did. Th- no, I was an intern. So, uh, so I'm in college and I get an internship at a TV station and that sucked. TV was so boring. And then I get an internship at an alternative radio station. And that was incredible. So like, like I'm there at six o'clock at night and night DJ goes, Hey, can you go someone's at the door? And I go, go to the door and it's like Nirvana. There's a uh, Kurt Cobain. He comes out of a blue van and I'm like, what's up? And he goes, Hey, I'm here to see Mike. I'm like, who are you guys? We're Nirvana. And I'm like, all right. So I bring these guys in, they eat pizza and they play. This is like 1990, right? And then and then I got my first job at in the same building was the sports station. It was called the Mighty 690. Um, and and so my first job, I was getting paid, they paid me sixteen thousand five hundred dollars a year. There you go. And they gave me coupons for dinner, free coupons. And so one of the first things I got to do is I'll never forget, it was um Wayne Gretzky and so the Mighty 690 was also in, it was in San Diego, but it was also carried in Los Angeles and they had the Kings and I had, and there was a, an actor by the name of Kirk Cameron was in town. He was the, he was in the TV show called Growing Pains and they were both in town doing some charity thing. And they're like, all right, we need someone to drive around Kirk Cameron. And I freaking loved Growing Pains. And yeah, I was like, yeah. I'll do it. I'll take Kirk Cameron around. I thought yeah. him and I would be best friends. And they're like, sorry, dude, because I was too excited. You're going to take Wayne Gretzky around. And I'm like, fuck. Oh, Wayne Gretzky. So I'm driving around in a Ford Escort that said the Mighty 690 on it. I'm driving Wayne Gretzky to, and he's in the back. He was cool. I mean, I don't even know if he remembers. I've seen him. I've met him a few times since. And in fact, I introduced him to Miley Cyrus at an event here one time, but I never told him, hey man, remember that time? <laughs> but he was very cool. So I drove him, I drove him around and, and that was one of the first times. That's where I was like, sports had just always been in my life. Yeah. Always. I can't get out of it. Like, why couldn't I be friend with, friends with the cast of Will and Grace? Uh, Instead, I'm, I become, I'm become great friends with Kurt Warner. You know what I mean? It's like, it's great. Hey, that's, that's how that works sometimes. I wish, I wish Kurt Warner's son would not have transferred out in Nebraska. That's a different story. I do want to keep going with what you said about, <laughs> uh, here, here's a topic that I'd be interested in your take on is you, you help a lot of people. You obviously involved with everything you do with love pup. You know, a lot of people, your Rolodex has to be ridiculous. Where do you draw boundaries though? When inevitably like any of us, right? People reach out to you for help, or maybe it's an introduction or they have a question or, Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? And you want to help people. You're a giver. I know this cause I know you, uh, but where, how do you, how do you address boundaries? Like, how do you kind of handle when it's like, Hey man, like I, I'm no, I either can't do that or I kind of off the clock right now or yeah, not so much. Where do you draw the line there? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, usually it, it, I, I don't think I'm off the clock when it comes to, if people can get a hold of me, I usually try to do everything I can. I mean, there's something that sticks in my head just from Christmas time. There was this woman born with a massive birth defect on her face and she wanted to get it removed. And I pulled every string I could to tra- she didn't have the money to get it removed. And it's just still bothering me that I couldn't help her do it. But there's too many legal issues with that, you know, for us to pay for it. There's just, I'm still trying to figure that out, but there's no, I mean, today I was trying to help a woman get a job. I'm trying to, you know, earlier today, there's, I'm just rescuing dogs, just helping people as much as I can. We try to pay rent. We try to do buy a car for somebody. I mean, just trying to do, you know, just my, my wife says to me, she's always said our entire relationship. She goes, you know, you, you want to leave an impact to chase the impact a B make sure that when your community misses you, when you're gone. Yeah. You know, that's so that's kind of how we live our life. Good. Well, what you've just told me is in case I ever move back to Phoenix, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go to you for advice on that. I'll reach out to you about 20 other things as well. Uh, I might move back to Phoenix at some point, by the way, I love Phoenix and maybe I want to be an intern at your show someday. You know, maybe I, maybe I decide all this is for the birds and I want to be an intern or, I mean, when is, when is Rich's contract up? Can I come after his job? 
dude, you could do your own show. You're a superstar. You're a superstar. 100%. You don't need me. I'd have to start like, listen, but you told me how I'd have to start. What's I would have, I'd have to move to Pittsburgh, right? I'd have to move to Pittsburgh. That's not how I started, bro. You can start your, you were already on your path. Yeah. Everybody's got, I was telling my son this yesterday. I was like, everybody has their own path, man. I was telling me, you know, I, and you know, again, I don't know. What's that guy's name. He plays for Miami. He went to a D3 school and then he went, and now he's like this great three point shooter. He went D3, then he went D1. And then he went, do you know what I'm talking about? Duncan, is that his name? Uh, I don't know. And I don't want to lie on the air. So I don't uh, want to lie. Well, no, don't lie. But anyway, there's this guy, there's this basketball player. who's like a superstar basketball player now. I'm going to look this But he had up. a different path. And be like, you know, right now when you watch, see, so I've been learning so much about this stuff. Like this high school basketball, it's yeah. so competitive. And there's these guys at the top, the top. 50 guys. They're on the cover, all the magazines, all the, all the Instagram stuff. And I'm like, no, that stuff matters. And my son's the one telling me too, no, that stuff matters. But as a dad, it still like kills me when I see players that I don't think are as good as my son and they get all the hype. Do you know all what your I mean? sons but play like, basketball? Huh? Do all your sons play basketball or is it just, is it my camp? two youngest, my oldest one is in the MMA and he's the Eagle scout and he's, you know, he's in the cars and guns and that stuff. And that's all great. My middle one is in the basketball. My youngest one's in the basketball too. Okay. But you know, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, when you talk about coaching, one of the things I got about your book, when I've, re- and I don't know if you ever get into high school coaching, it's all coaching, but it's like, yeah. what I've noticed about high school coaching is sometimes like, I, I, by the way, I have this, I have this Bible. Have you heard of the coach's Bible? Do yeah. You have yeah. That? yeah. 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 Oh, I read those things every, I read that passage every day. I think the coach's Bible is literally, it's amazing. It's a gift. So I read this passage and I think it was, I think it was on, I think it was February 4th, February 2nd passage of, of I don't know if you call it a passage or or a devotional. Yeah, we'll, we'll call it a passage. Okay. And it says on there, it was about coaches and there's so many coaches that don't coach with love. They coach with a state, like assemble teams. They they're more about assembling a team than they are about working with a team and coaching with love and then versus winning. And I, I see that all the time. And that bothers me so much. You know, you talk about these coaches. I want to be like John Wooden. I think that's okay. Give me a John Wooden versus somebody who assembles a team. Yeah, you know but, what I mean? but you but you can't. You, like the thing is, the mistake there where I'll fire back is when people think that's the only way to coach, right? Like my oh, I agree. Ar- my argument is you have to be more of like what you are. Like if you just try to mimic, you, we talked about this with authenticity. The issue is, is most coaches think they have to be, and 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 also they misattribute this. They see what they know about John Wooden. John Wooden also lost his temper, temper, John Wooden, you know, cuss and what have you. But I, John Jay, I've had people literally call and email me after a show that say, Hey man, there is a cuss word on your show. I expect more given your background in coaching. Right. So like what I mean is people think being a coach is squeaky clean and that's that, that has nothing to do with it. You know, now you don't need to be some avant-garde, super edgy dude. Like that's not the point either. The point is, is that there's a gray area, just like being a parent, man. You talked about being a parent. I look at it this way. Who's going to tell you or me the absolute 100% best way to parent our children? They're not, man. Like there's a gray area there. And there's of course things that are morally and ethically wrong, but even that varies across cultures. But the point is, is when people want to tell like everybody what a good coach is and what a bad coach is, somebody gets a static idea in their mind. And then they just try to mimic some coach that they read about, you know, as opposed to just understanding who the hell they are as a person. And you can't, you can't do that. You can't figure out your coaching methodology until you have some form of self-awareness and you're ready to own up to your own shit. That's really good statement. Oh, by the way, I got to tell you, when you talk about giving back and stuff, there was a kid, there was a kid back, I'm talking 20 years ago when I was, my show was just on in Tucson and you know, you know who Lute Olson is? Yeah. Yeah. So Lute, Lute Olson was the U of A basketball coach and, and they, and the radio station wanted me to have him on all the time. And I was like, okay, he was, he's a legend. I put him on everyone. So he was great. And he was so kind to me always. Um, but there was a guy on this team, he was a walk-on and he had this incredible personality and he, he was just, he was, he wanted to be a coach. He was an assistant to the assistant to the assistant. He was nobody, but he had a personality like crazy. So he, I put him on my show every once in a while. And I'd say, how was the game last night? And he had so much personality. He became a, a, a fixture on my show. Once a week after the Wildcats played, I'd put this kid on my show. And he'd call and he had every day above ground is a great day. John Jay, how are you? And he, his family was from Houston. He was all alone in Tucson. So I took him to my house. We'd have Thanksgiving in my house. And then as time went on, he moved up the ranks and he was like an assistant to the assistant coach. He wasn't, he wasn't Luth's assistant, but he was an assistant. And I saw so much potential in him. And I would like, I, you know, like Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. Yeah. It's a great book. I said to him, I go, Hey man, take this book. I want you to read this book. 
and he read the book. He was like, thank you so much. You know, and then I gave him Dale Carnegie's, you know, how to win friends. And like, oh, you got to read this book. And he read that book. And I gave him a couple other books. I Lee Iacocca's book. I was like, this is a really good book. I know it's, I, so he read that book. And so time goes on that guy. Let me tell you where he is right now. Oh, I actually set him up on a date with a girl. He's now married to her. Really? And he has, yeah, he's got three kids with her. And he is a coach in Atlanta. I think he's, he lives by you. You should connect with him. Yeah. His name is Josh, Josh Pastner. I mean, I'm pissed that you didn't give my book. Can we talk about that for a second? Why I not? want to give him his book. I'll give him your book. He is, he's the coach, basketball coach at Georgia Tech. Isn't that by you? Yeah. Yeah. I, but yeah, just an hour away, you know, like with tra the traffic here is definitely not like it is in Phoenix, man. Phoenix, right? Like, I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I felt like you go and you, you drive in Phoenix and you're like, ah, it's just open highway. Like, you're good to go. No way. No, you haven't been here in a while then. Dude, the, uh, nothing compares to Atlanta. LA doesn't compare to Atlanta, but you made a good point about the assembling a team versus coaching or what have you. Like, I don't know if you, like, here's the thing, right? Like, I don't know if you remember this. You remember when like Isaiah, Ta uh, Isaiah Thomas, who, who hired him? It was like the New York Knicks, right? 2003, they, they made uh, uh, Isaiah Thomas, the president of basketball operations. And this is kind of what I mean by one dimensional thinking and people thinking they have to be one thing and can't be authentic and what have you. And, and what have you is Isaiah Thomas had this idea of basically saying, uh, I want to assemble a team, uh, where everybody that we acquire is, is the, uh, like has the highest scoring average for their position. Right. So he was looking, no matter what their position was, he was looking for people that, that ranked highest in terms of scoring average. Cause you know, they thought like, that's how you win a basketball game, right? You score more points than, than the other team. And so they did this, there was this big experiment. They won, I think they had, you know, they, they won one year and then the next four or five years they had losing seasons. It did not go well. And what they realized, you know, when they started to pull this apart is, you know, basketball is not one dimensional, just like coaching isn't just like broadcasting. Isn't just like life isn't right. There's at least like five major factors critical to success. When you look at, uh, you know, basketball, like and again, goes back to improv, right? It's not about the one liner. You don't, you're, you're not good at improv via one liner. You gotta, you gotta pass the ball to your partner. You gotta know when to do this. You gotta play, you gotta play different positions. So the thing is, you gotta put together a complimentary profile. And he didn't do that. And so it's tricky when people think this is just what a good coach is, a good broadcaster is, a good parent is, a good whatever is. It's like, mm, no, shit's a little bit more complex than that. I I know I know you have an affinity for basketball. So I thought you might at least uh you might appreciate that story and put that one in the handbook sometime. I think that's a great story. Um, I think it's powerful. I think that's, uh, that says a lot. I, I say that your story reminds me, uh, it's, I'm going through this kick right now, uh, a Tom Brady kick. Yeah. Cause I didn't know a lot about Tom Brady. Oh, there's this, have you seen that documentary called um, uh, the greatest in search of greatness? So yeah. Oh, I love it. I've watched it three times. hundred percent. So yeah. Greatness can't be planned in many ways. Right. They talk about this in a lot. Wayne Gretzky's in that. Yeah. Wayne Gretzky's in that. Yeah. I became obsessed with that documentary. I reached out to the director and the director and I became friends. I want um, him on the podcast. I'm, you said oh, there's, dude, no, you said there's no boundaries. I want him on the podcast. Gabe. His name's Gabe. He's unbelievable. He's un And he also did another one, another hockey documentary called The Red Red Something. He's unbelievable, this guy. Um, but so that document, when I saw Tom Brady in that documentary, someone there's a, a longer documentary on YouTube about Tom Brady. And when I see that, it's like an hour long. But I see that that in 11th grade, nobody knew who he was. He didn't, you know, he, how they say he's the slowest He's, he's out of shape at the combine. He's all this, he's all, and I'm like, I'm like, this is, this is what I'm just talking to you about right now in basketball. They're just talking about all the guys that are phenomenal athletes at, at 17 years old. When there's a basketball Tom Brady out there, there's someone who has heart, heart can't be measured, no. you know? Well, yeah. And well, then there's Steph Curry. I, I learned about Steph Curry who plays for Golden State. Same thing. The guy's in 11th grade. Nobody knows who he is, right? Then he goes to Davis. Nobody knows who he is. And he, I don't know the rest of the story, but he's the best three-point shooter like in the country. So I love those stories. And that's what's scary about it though, right? Like when we talk about like uh, leadership or coaching or what have you, or, or any domain, when people think that it's trait-based, right? Like you said, Tom Brady, like Tom Brady didn't have a lot of the classic-based traits that, that made people fawn over him at the combine. Is I mean, I mean, anybody can right. watch that video. And so it freaks me out when we live in a time where again, cancel culture is rampant, all this stuff is rampant, you know, like uh, what kind of leaders do we want, right? Are we just hoping that everybody's squeaky clean, has all the perfect traits? Like greatness can't be planned in many ways. It comes in different formats, shapes, sizes, you know, whatever. And it gets tricky. It gets scary when I, I literally think society has one clear idea of what, what is success. And I think they got to be careful what they wish for, because then 
people that are unscrupulous are just going to reflect back at them, right? Like people are going to get better at bullshitting you and uh, they're going to get better at faking all these things. Like, how do you manage that as a father? Like, what do you tell your boys about that? Like you have three boys that are going to grow up in today's culture where literally anything they say or do now, especially because you're a public figure, it it can like derail their lives 20 years from now. Like, do you even address that? I talk about them every day, especially... uh, I mean, I mean, I love, I, I, I like, I don't like there to be restrictions on their thinking yeah. and on comedy. Uh, you know, I grew up, my mom taking me to go see Richard Pryor movies and, and stand up specials and Eddie Murphy. And I love, I just love comedy so much. And I don't like there to be rules on comedy. So my kids watch family guy and South park. And sometimes that stuff is just so off the charts, but I tell them, you cannot repeat that. You right. cannot say that in front of somebody else. I go, something's going to happen to you or something's going to happen to me because you said something. So I work with them on that all the time. It just happened this weekend. I can't even repeat the story to you because it's, it's so awful, but cause you know, it's like, you can't, well, you can't say that. You can't say that. Like that was a family guy thing. You can't say that. So, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm very cautious with my kids about that kind of stuff. Man. But, but you feel so, like they fully even like, you know, like they fully grasp it because there's things we all yes. hear. You're like, they, yes, I have sent it into their soul. I don't think you get, yeah, it's been a, that's a big, big thing in my house. Big thing in my house. Yeah. Um, wait, there was something else. Oh, I was to tell you about, so what do you think of Tim Grover? Have you read his stuff? Ah, uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. Why? But hit okay, me with that. It. I'll do some research the, right now. The book is called Relentless. He was Michael Jordan's coach. Oh, you know what? I have Kobe's this coach. on my bookshelf. I've just never, I've never had a chance to read it yet. It's on my bookshelf right now. Yeah. Oh, and he's, he's, a, he's reachable. You shoot him a DM. He'll get back to you. Like he's phenomenal. His book is pretty, I'd like to know what you think of his book, but and by the way, what, what, you know, as I, so, you know, here I am having these kids that are athletes. So for me to learn stuff, I've tried to watch every documentary. I've tried to read books that I think are, that can help me, you know, connect with my kids. That's a big thing for me. So with, through sport, I've been watching as many documentaries as I can. What, because we talked about in search of greatness, what, what documentary would you say, would you recommend that I watch? Man, in terms of the, the the sport context in particular, or movie, not not even like a, yeah, like I have this friend of mine. Do you know who Phil Beckner is? Ah, uh-uh, no, I don't. Oh, I got to connect with him too. He is Damian Lillard's shooting coach, and he's a he's a. I know he doesn't like to be called shooting coach. What does he call the um, guy? Player development. And okay. He has a yeah. lot of pro guys in the NBA, and um, he he's he has his players. He makes them watch. I think it's five movies before he'll train with them. One of the movies is Will Smith's Pursuit of Happiness. Great movie. Yeah. So I sat down with my son and watched that movie. And it's like, because the message in that movie is you got a goal, you got a dream, no matter, you don't stop. Like that, Will Smith did not stop. Yeah. You know, now the guy's worth $60 million, the character he played, you know. So it's like, uh, so are there any movies that you recommend to your athletes or that you watch and you're like, this is a great, this movie inspired me? Yeah, man. But uh, the, the reality is much like in uh, in Search of Happiness, in Pursuit of Happiness, they're not, they're not, sport related necessarily, right? Like I'm a big believer. Yeah. So one, let me just say this and you can choose if this is, I don't make people watch this, but I do encourage it. The best documentary I've ever seen of any genre and and I'll get a lot of hate for this because people will be like, oh, the first two you got to get through, but episodes three and four is when it comes together and you'll get goosebumps is the defiant ones on HBO. And I've seen it unbelievable. Like it's phenomenal. Like, I mean, for people that can really pick up on what that's about huge, but for people that just get bored on, on, uh, episode one and two, uh, you know, I got nothing to say to you, but that is the best. And then in, in, if you wouldn't have told me that you watch in search of greatness without a doubt that, and again, I'm, I'm hundred percent biased, man. We run, and you don't know this cause we haven't talked in a long time. We run workshops that are based off this principle of helping coaches. Like, believe it or not, man, like coaches get no training on interactions, social skills, anything to do with ethical, like persuade, knowing how to deal with the art of coaching, right? Like a a coach, whether sport coach, strength and conditioning coach, they can throw a pen and hit 8 million workshops that teach them how to lift weights, run, do agility, do this, nothing. There's nothing out there for the art of coaching. And so we started the first one on that. We call them the apprenticeship. And we use several clips from Pursuit of Greatness because when they talk about like, you know, the biggest thing you can know as a dad uh, of children, right, is you don't want to teach them how to do things in a mechanistic fashion. Look at Patrick Mahomes. He's a great example of this. That dude does not throw a football the way that any classic kind of like quarterback coach would be like, this is how you throw a football. That guy, because of some unique advantages he has with what's called thoracic mobility, he can throw balls that he should not be able to throw. Now imagine mm-hmm. if he grew up and somebody was like, no, this is how you throw a ball. This is how you do it. So the, the number one thing I try to get kids to understand or parents or what have you is like, there needs to be exploration. 
there needs to be this idea. Think about it this way. There's something called an affordance, right? And we won't get too nerdy, too nerdy about this, but like an affordance, John Jay is something that like, it's this thing that basically tells you how to interact with something. So a light switch, you know, that's for flicking a doorknob, you know, that's for turning. Well, let's say you saw a puddle, that puddle in the street is an affordance. Now, what you do to get over that puddle depends on the properties of it. If it's a small puddle, what are you going to do to get over that puddle? Jump. You could, well, I mean, maybe. Walk you could around just it. Ste- yeah, you could walk around it. You could step over it. If it's a large puddle, then you're going to jump, leap. You might have to run or what have you. So the thing you want kids to do is you want them to explore within simplicity, right? It's like, hey, man, like I'm going to give you, I saw this guy trying to teach his son yesterday. We were walking around the neighborhood. You'll appreciate this and nobody can see it, but he was teaching his son how to hold a bat. And this kid just looked rigid. He looked tight. He looked like he was choking somebody out. And if you watch baseball, man, I mean, there's Hall of Famers that hold bats up here, right. you know, like the Barry Bond shit. Ken Griffey Jr. has got a very different swing than Mickey Mantle. You have to have this range of exploration. So one movie that I think does that really well in terms of just this idea of curiosity, this idea of always looking up and asking why and trying to explore, um, and, and it'll be contentious, but I loved Interstellar. I liked that, you know, and I'm not a huge McConaughey fan, to be honest. I'd love to hang out with him. He's got a lot of whiskey wisdom, but that whole movie is about like, you know, uh, you know, looking up and, and wondering, like he says, you know, we, we now look at the ground and wonder, you know, like we have our feet in the dirt. We used to look up and wonder where our place was in the stars. And I think curiosity does more for athletic development than just about anything else. So if you have a coach, that's very rigid. That's tricky, man. Cause people aren't going to move the same. They're not, you didn't see Don Terry Poe. When you watch me train those guys move the same as Kaepernick, you didn't see, uh, you know, o- Odell or any of those guys move. Like they all kind of accomplish a task in different ways. And that's the thing I'd encourage parents to do. Does, does that answer your question? All I, I gave you defi- defiant ones, interstellar in search of greatness. I'm sure there's others. I, I think everybody should watch, um, the hurricane with Denzel Washington. Cause that teaches you that's, that's a movie I saw at 14, and that shit taught me how to manage my emotions a little bit better, which I still struggle with. But world champion boxer wrongfully imprisoned due to racial issues. And this guy was like had to deal with his own demons in solitary confinement for, I think, over 20 years and then came out and was able to do something positive with his life. I blacked out. I answered a lot there. No, that was great. What about so my friend Phil, again, the, the player development coach also has his players watch Warrior, which I'm sure you watch. Tom Hardy. And- yeah. Yeah. Tom Hardy's like Tom Hardy, Robert Downey Jr. My two favorite actors. So warrior, but then I never saw warrior because I think it's about two brothers that fight each other at the finals. And I just didn't, I, I have this problem watching brothers fight, you know, having yeah, you three boys, like, but you wouldn't like my the, household. The, the message of that movie, he says is just powerful. So, but, but anyway. I thought warrior's good. I don't know if it would be on my list. I think it's a good movie to watch, but I think my list would be, and I'll, I'll have to shoot you some more. Cause now you got me thinking, but yeah, I mean the fatherhood thing, it's interesting, man, because there's just so many ways to trip up and especially do any of your kids, Jay Dutch or Kemp, are any of them just overthinkers inside their own heads a lot? Like, do any of them just kind of get, you know, perfectionistic to a, to a, yes. kind of, which one? My oldest one. I mean, he's a, he's the Eagle Scout and he's the guy that'll clean his car over and over and over again to make sure it's spotless. And he's the guy that makes sure everything is perfect. You know, my youngest one doesn't care. He'll take off his clothes in the kitchen and his whole house is our closet. Yeah. How do you, and by the way, I want to know, did you name Dutch after the movie Dutch? You remember that movie? I named him Dutch after, I remember that movie, but I named him Dutch because my father, my father who passed away, he's, he's from the Netherlands and his language is Dutch. So I wanted to, I wanted to honor my dad. Very simple, man. Very simple. Well, listen, I got yeah. one more for you and then I know your time's valuable and I don't want to get invoiced for this shit. So, you hey, know, man, are you kidding me? You know, I'll get uh, next thing, you know, I'll get some from the John Jay and Rich show that they, they, you, he took our best content, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> So what, what are the demons you're still struggling with right now? Because when we met, man, first of all, you train like a madman, but in an intelligent way. You always got after it. You liked learning, but you you train with a kind of a different kind of purpose, right? And nobody does that with that level of consistency and tenacity and focus without kind of having, you got, you got a little, and it's darkness, I think people think is bad. Darkness can be good. You need darkness to get to the gray area, right? But like, what are some demons you're still trying to overcome personally or professionally? It's funny you say darkness in that Tim Grover's book. He talks about, you know, the top of the top, the top athletes, the top people in the world, they have to deal with, he calls the dark side. If you're really the best, the best, you have a dark side. You yeah, have me, to. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. It's, um, for me, I mean, it's, my, what am I battling? It's, you know, my weight, my binging issues, which I was blown away. I was glued to your book, bro your story in the hospital glued to it. You didn't know that, that I did not know that about you. And I was freaking, I remember your back surgery, 
Did you ever um, see the picture? Did, you, did I ever show I you the picture? I saw the picture today. Why am I get this feedback now? You hear that no, weird feedback? No, you're good. Okay. We'll edit uh, it out. Um, I saw the picture today, but that story was so riveting. It's like, a, it was like, a, it's a movie, bro. It's a movie. It was just so riveting. But talk I just to me wanted about, to hear it in your voice. You can, you can relate though. Like talk to me about, like you said, you, you like, not just- like that. My, my, my issue is this, is this like, I'm 250 pounds and I want to, you know, I want to be 220 and every once in a while, you know, like I just started that fasting thing. My, my doctor put me on, she was like, you need to fast. So I'm on an 18 hour fast. But what I'm dealing with now is like, so my window is one to seven. So I eat, I try to eat as much as I can between one to seven and I go, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, but, but with your routines, John Jay, like how, I mean, listen, like I follow you, you're always doing yoga, you're doing training, you're doing this. Like, so what right. trips you, is it the diet, the trip? Like what's your, what's your guilty It's always pleasure? the food. It's, it's always the food. Like I'll go, uh, today's not the day. Today's, uh, I remember for some reason, I remember learned this at Exos, but today was the, you know, they're always, Wednesday was always a rest day, but uh, today's the day that I'm chilling. But tomorrow I'll take my son to his trainer and you know, who I told, gave, told him all about, you got to meet this trainer at some point. His name's Chuck Howard. His son is Marcus Howard who plays for the Nuggets. Yeah. Um, and he, he was over at Marquette. He was a superstar at Marquette, but Chuck is this amazing human being. He's the one that gave me the coach's Bible as a gift a couple of years ago. So we'll go train. I'll train with Chuck and I, you know, he works with my body and then he trains my son Kemp as a basketball player. Um, but I'll train, I'll train three or four times a week with him. And then I do the Peloton in the morning, but for me, it's always diet. I just can't get that down. That's my biggest demon, man. I just cannot, it's been something I've been working on. I need to rephrase that. Uh, I, I need to, I don't want to put that out in the energy uh, that in the universe that I, I cannot get it. I'm, I'm working on my diet. But we have, we, like, there's definitely an episode and I'll, I'll send it to you after the show. Uh, but there is an episode. I'm trying to look it up as we're going through it. There is a really good episode that we did with, uh, Angie Ash. She's a dietitian and one that's like super realistic, right? We talk about all the stuff out there that kind of people promote. Like at the time, Game Changers was a documentary. Everybody was getting into I saw it. Yeah. And so we talk about some of the, you know, the hype versus the BS and, and, and stuff like that. You should definitely look into that. But man, like, I just want to tell you, like, I have a ton of respect and I got asked a question the other day. I have a ton of respect for you. And I got asked another question. Like, if you weren't doing this, what would you do? And I don't think it was until I was really exposed to you that I was like, you know what? Like I would probably, I could totally see myself trying to pursue like a radio show or whatever, like podcasting. And this shit is just like therapeutic, you know? And, and the answer before mm-hmm. that was always, oh, I'll be an, uh, I'd be an FBI criminal profiler. Cause I like dealing kind of with people and, and figuring out kind of what makes them tick. But you're, you've been a huge kind of a uh, metric and barometer of how to keep things uh, direct, informed, but also casual and comfortable on the air. And I fail at it tremendously, but I want you to know that I definitely admire that about you. And I'm, I'm just glad to give me the time of the day to even come on the show for a little bit. Oh, man, it was my pleasure. It was great talking to you. I'm sorry that it's taken so long. It's no, been- no. We're- I wanted to give you, I, you know, cause we talked a, a while ago about doing it, but I wanted to give the right equipment and have the right setup. And I hate these zooms, these zoom interviews or, or they have that weird audio. So I wanted to make sure, I hope that I sounded crystal clear today. Uh, you know, I, I, went, I listened to one of your podcasts and there's just something about the zoom sound that is a turnoff for me. Well, here's the you thing. I mean? Yeah. And I was gonna, I was gonna let you go, but here's the thing since you went there and, and I think it's good to put out on the air. The, the, the thing that we try to get people to understand, and it's tricky, and I didn't understand it either, right? So I'm laughing at myself too when I did podcasts in the past, is I don't think people understand how important audio quality is. And, right. you know, we can't force our guests to have anything, you know, and we're not going to, you know, we always suggest, hey, try to have some headphones or a microphone, the clearer, the better. Try to have a room where there's not a lot of, you know, bullshit around you. And um, there's the, all of our guests are super smart, talented people, uh, but I'm constantly surprised when sometimes people will come on and it's like, literally just buy a, a, a 40 or $70 or a $30, anything like microphone, like buy a microphone and a $5 pop filter because it's kind of your resume to the world a little bit. And I cringe at my old interviews because we were trying to figure it out. And I don't have, you know, I don't have a guy, you know, like I was like, I want to do a podcast and we hired some people, uh, a guy who's like, use this, you, this. Oh, the audio is shit, man. We didn't figure it out for a while. And I still am going to have some reverb because you can see the jerseys behind me. I'd love to be able to call somebody in Atlanta and be like, make me a studio. I ain't there yet. Um, but the audio quality. It's a matter. It sounds good right now. What you have now sounds really good. I mean, you, you know, you asked me about mistakes. So one of the things I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, you're I, fine. But I, I, so I, I started my own podcast. I call it writing the bench. And it's where I started because my son learning about basketball, I didn't know anything about basketball. So I thought I got this freaking radio station here you know, I got a pretty good reputation. Let me pull some strings and let me start interviewing people that can help me understand basketball. So I started this podcast called Riding the Bench. 
right? Cause I didn't play sports. And if I did, I was on the bench. I mean, my dad was my soccer coach in 12th grade and in, in sixth grade. And I prayed to God, he wouldn't play me. Right. I was like, please don't put me in dad. So I, I started this podcast and I would interview people to learn about basketball, but it was learning about what my son was going through. I want to learn about recovery. I want to learn about training. I want to learn more about, like I wanted to interview the biggest basketball player in the world, but I didn't care about his stats on last yeah. night's game. I want to know about when he was in high school and how he trained. I wanted to know about, did he put his knees in ice? I wanted to learn about how his dad trained him, what time they wake up, that kind of stuff. Right. So I started interviewing. I interviewed a guy from the trailblazers. I interviewed a bunch of different people. Then I thought, I want to interview these guys. Dads forget yeah, about That's interesting. I, I don't really care about, I mean, the players, that's cool. I'm going to talk to you too, but to me, it was more about the dad. So I had this opportunity to interview a uh, Devin Booker's dad, Melvin. So Melvin and I became pretty friendly at a son's game. So I invited him in the studio. He sat down with me. I did this. In, I thought it was an incredible interview with this guy, about an hour interview. And I learned so much about Devin Booker and how his dad trained him and how they got it. I mean, it was just blew my mind, especially when you tell stories about playing in a tournament and nobody knew who he was. And he was like, dad, look, there's Kelly Oubre over there. There's so-and-so over there. And meanwhile, now he was playing with those guys in the pros, right? So anyway, the interview's over and he leaves. And I've seen him 10 times since then. And um, I post the interview and it turns out the back of the microphone wasn't connected of his microphone. Yeah. So you hear his interview through my microphone. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah. Right. So I could easily do it again, but I don't want to do it again because I already asked those questions. Like I don't want to do it again. Yeah, man. That moment, like it's tricky. Sometimes when we interview people, we tell them, Hey, hit the, in case there's an audio issue, hit record on your phone. And even if we get shit audio, at least we have something. Right. But, like you can hear the mel, you can hear the interview and you can hear and it's a great interview. It's still up there, but, but it's like, to me, it's like, okay, the content was there, but I'm, but you know, I learned a lot for me when I was in the interview, but sucked, man. I was bummed out. Well, and here's where you're spot on about that. And it was an approach we took with this show. And maybe I'm an idiot. You mentioned a while back, like you don't really like interviewing celebrities and, and what have you is when we started the podcast, you know, we had this guy that was like, Hey, your podcast isn't going to blow up unless you start reaching out to like, uh, you know, people that are super established and this and that. And I said, yeah, man, but like, here's the thing. I, I kind of want a, an episode, a podcast for underdogs. Like there's certain people right. that they've been passed around. They do every fucking show, you know, they do every show. Right. And so I'm like, I want to give a platform to people that like, haven't had a voice and maybe have some shit to say. These are people in all different professions that have, some of them have never been on, uh, on a podcast. And I'm like, I want it to be unique content. Cause it's cool. Like they come on with a chip on their shoulder. Right. And they want to share something. Whereas I could, I know I could reach out to certain people and it's always a pain in the ass. Cause like you have to go through six levels. Um, but, it, but it's tricky. And I, I think it costs me on some side of things because there's going to be people that are like, Hey, um, you know, you're not, somebody will share, but these celebrities aren't going to share it. So what I'm going to try to get, uh, let's say, uh, you know, I'm going to try to get so-and-so on this and think that they're going to share it on their Instagram. And then I'm going to get, oh, now all of a sudden I got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. It doesn't work that way. Content's got to come first, right? Right, right. And so that's, You're right. You know, I agree. it's hard to get people to like, do you ever interview people on the other hand though? Like when you have them on and they're not celebrities or they haven't been interviewed a lot, how do you coach somebody if you're kind of like, all right, I need your ass to open up a little bit, be a little bit more natural. Do you have any tactics that you use for, for kind of getting people out of their own heads and getting them interacting more organically? If they're not a celebrity and I'm interviewing them. I mean, like, so that's, there's, the deal, like if they're like something happens in the community and I put them on the air, that kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like you do, I mean, you do a lot of calling and I'm sure some of that is script, you know, scripted or at least orchestrated to a degree, no. but okay. It's not. No, 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 no. Everything like when people call into the show, I mean, our phone producer might go, our phone screen would be like, oh, what are you calling about? Oh yeah. Did you see that fight at the mall yesterday? Okay. I need you to amp it up. Have a lot of energy. We're going to patch you through. John Jay's going to say, what's up Francine. And you say, Hey, I'm calling about the fight that happened yesterday. <laughs> like, you know, to cut the, to cut the, the, Hey, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, how are yeah. you? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Not much. What's going on with you? Like, I got to keep the show moving. You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't, but uh, we don't do that stuff. It's a, we're 100%. I make sure that happens. There's a lot of people that don't do that. That's why our calls are taped so that we can eliminate crap. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, like I was telling you about, uh, silence, we got to cut silence out. So make things move a little bit faster. But when you talk to somebody in the community, sometimes they're just real people. Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta, I got today. We had, we took a call from a girl and she was telling a story about a bar fight that she was in with her sisters. And it was, it should have been a 45 second phone call. It was a nine minute phone call <laughs> Oh shit. live on the radio. Oh, your producers minutes. like that wrap it up, wrap so it up, wrap it hard. up. The producer's mad at me because I saw him put her, her name on the screen and I was live and I was like, I went, Hey, Victoria, 
what's your story? And he's like, he's like, I'm still talking to her. But I saw her name on the screen and I'm like, just put her through, put her through like that. I'm like, put her through, put her through. So he puts her through and that's my bad because he wasn't done screening her. Yep. And it was a nine minute phone call. And then my sister walked in and ordered a beer. Oh. And then this girl said there, there was a birthday party going on and the birthday party was obnoxious and there was gang bangers in the bar. And then and I'm like, oh no. You know what I mean? So I got to try to go, oh man, okay. And then I look at some, I look for a spot sometimes with Rich. I'll be like, I'll go cut that line out. But I can't look like an a hole. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. So yeah, so there's well, a fine line. I'll tell you what, man. You didn't give us any moments of silence or non uh, incredible content. I want to thank you again. I uh, yeah, this has just been really cathartic. I think just to catch up. I mean, it's been six, seven years, and and again, we didn't script this right. Like this is you and me rapping. So thank you for even coming on, giving me the time of day. If people want to support Love Pup or anything you do, and obviously we'll include the links in the show notes and all that. But where can they go right now? Because we got a lot of dog lovers, a lot of dog people on the show. Or if there's another charity or foundation or something, or or where where can we direct them? I got two foundations. I got Love Pup Foundation on Instagram. That's the best way, Love Pup Foundation. And that's a dog rescue. And we we help dog rescues all around the country. I mean, my wife has done so much with that rescue where literally, I mean, we are helping dog rescues around the country, not just our own dog rescue. And then we have Love Up Foundation. Love Up is a foster care, helping kids in foster care. And, um, you know, you can that's Love Up Foundation on Instagram. Those are the two best ways, you know. Um, that's it. Those are the only two things. We don't need to promote anything else. Yeah, well, simple, man. Well, dude, I appreciate you and everybody else. Thanks for listening. As always, Brett Bartholomew from the Art of Coaching Podcast with my friend, John J. Van S. We'll see you next time. 